Uh, so it's nice to meet you. Again, I'm Jim Chess and I work up here at OHSU in sports medicine. I have a family medicine background. Uh, but I do 100% sports medicine and uh, certainly a lot of a lot of concussion management. So uh, I'll get started here and we'll we'll get rolling. So uh, I'm going to put this full screen. I think if it will go. Looks like it. Just thinking about it. Um, but uh, let's see here. There we go. Very good. So. <clears throat> We're going to learn about some of the state laws just briefly. I know you've had some education on that before, and learn how to apply some uh, guidelines uh, about concussion management and rehabilitation. Uh, talk about some strategies to uh, recover from concussion, and then you know get back to school and work, and then just highlight some of the um, the research uh, along the way. So uh, just briefly, uh, we do a lot of work up here to OHSU, uh, a number of cutting edge areas in clinical care specifically around rehab and clinical outcomes, sensory integration, uh, balance, and, and auditory processing. Uh, we're working on chronic traumatic encephalopathy as well, which we'll talk about, and then a lot around informatics and clinical guidelines that have been published here for years uh, uh, internationally through OHSU. And we hold that yearly uh, seminar. I don't know how many of you were able to attend, but we've collaborated with a number of these organizations across the state and, and look to collaborating with whoever is interested in concussion um, <clears throat> research, uh, clinical care, and also just helping the state system uh, work better. So uh, we have about 150 clinicians working on this, and I co-chair the uh, consortium at OHSU on TBI uh, with the chair of psychiatry and neurosurgery. And uh, we work with the VA a lot as well. And so uh, these are kind of some of the things that we're, we're doing. Um, a lot of systems, just to show you how, how we work here, and kind of we have a preseason impact baseline testing, and a lot of organizations around the, the state do that as well. <clears throat> um, so the athletic trainers can work on the field, but we also work with them uh, in helping people get early care, uh, but also helping get their continue to get their care uh, at the school or with their primary care doctor as much as possible. When needed, we can access this concussion rehab team, which we'll talk about. And with more severe problems, we fortunately have a lot of access to neuropsychology, neuro, neurology, neurosurgery, etc. And we have a concussion support group that's uh, also very helpful. This is kind of like a model of care that you'll see for concussions, either coming, you know, if it's a sports-related concussion from the school, an athletic trainer could be the school nurse. Uh, anybody in the school can identify someone with a concussion. Also, it could be from the nurse department or primary care. And then uh, if we uh, note that they're not improving like normally in about three weeks, we typically get them involved in the rehab team, which could include uh, a, a number of different uh, of these uh, specialists. <clears throat> if I get this one to go, Nick, there we go. And we also have outside referrals. But uh, just to let you know, we have over 5,000 visits a year around TBI, which is kind of a crazy high number of people. That have TBIs uh, that come through our system, and, and you know that just think about all the rest throughout the whole state as well. Uh, about 60% are students, and about 25% get referred on through rehab services. <clears throat> the thing about it is that we, we know that uh, we want to keep people active. If we're not, if they're not active, then they're typically couch potatoes or having problems of inactivity. But we want to exercise, certainly at their own risk, but in a, in a safe way. So we're trying to really figure out ways to, to exercise more safely in the settings of contact sports, et cetera, and also to um, understand the short and long-term risks a little better and then have healthcare uh, professionals managing concussions with kind of uniform protocols and then make use of technology uh, where we can. You may know a little bit about the Oregon plan. We've had a statewide network of physician uh, cover, uh, coverage kind of assistance for a while and we've developed some uniform protocols, and we also use the impact system a lot, and we coordinate a lot with the OSAA, who uh, manages the state um, uh, sporting uh, and activities associations. <clears throat> so uh, you also have heard about the OCAMP, and that's a group that uh, we've all been uh, integrally involved with, with Seabird and uh, a number of other people around the state since about 2008, I think we all got together. And uh, this, this has a multidisciplinary team that's uh, really fantastic. And, uh, uh, you know, the Department of Education is involved, as well as the OSA, athletic directors, et cetera, and uh, the um, 
uh, Siebert plays a, a major part in that as well. <clears throat> These are kind of the three, uh, at least, clinical centers, um, and as well as Siebert, of course, down in Eugene with, doc with Dr. Keister, and there's a number of researchers uh, down there doing great work, uh, Lee, Lee Sanchao, uh, and over in Bend, uh, Vivian Ogaldi and Senator Marsh Marshall lead the, um, the clinical care over there, and then up at um, OHSU, we have a number of us uh, involved as well. So you may have heard uh, along the way about Max's Law, and just briefly, Max's Law was put into place in 2008 because we really couldn't change the way concussions were cared for without, uh, really, uh, without getting a state law. And along with Washington, we were the first two state laws uh, passed really within weeks of each other. The three concepts are no, replan uh, no return to play the same day as a concussion, medical release needed to return to play, and yearly coaches education, which can be taken free on the OSA website. So that all started in July of 2009. You can see Max here. Max was a quarterback down in Gold Beach, had multiple you know, concussions in one week, and during the game uh, got hit hard enough that he didn't recover. And he is alive and, and well in, in many ways, but um, he has uh, a chronic traumatic uh, brain uh, injury and uh, needs a lot of assistance to, uh, to get through life. So we, we've honored him by, uh, by trying to uh, keep things going. Uh, in his name, but to really help others prevent that. And here's, these are the concepts of Max's Law, and basically there are these four R's, which is recognized so that everybody, parents, athletes, coaches, recognize concussions, remove them, uh, those who have concussions as soon as possible, not allowing them to return to play until they're cleared. So they're referred uh, to the appropriate medical professionals as well as the school uh, concussion team, and then returned uh, through the appropriate protocols, which we'll talk about. <clears throat> Briefly, this is Zachary Lysa's law in Washington, and it basically has the same concepts as the Oregon law, except for that they have to sign a release before they can play on public lands, uh, so everybody knows uh, how to treat concussions. We found out by, uh, you know, for fairly early on after Max law that there were a lot of people exercising and playing in, in uh, club sports and just doing activities on the weekends that weren't governed at all by the um, OSA or the other state law. So uh, another state law was put into place called um, Jenna's Law, um, again, honoring somebody, somebody um, who had multiple concussions who was willing to speak out and be a public figure, and that, that's Jenna Sneva uh, here next to the governor, and, so, and, and her mother over here. And of course, it takes lawmakers like um, uh, Elizabeth Steiner and others to, to really be helpful in this. Uh, so, uh, but I think this has made a big impact in bringing all the sports, including uh, private, private schools, private organizations, and uh, schools together. We do have online, uh, this is kind of an early form, just as Max Law, but we do have online under ocamp.org and Seabird um, how to implement these laws within the schools and your community. So I encourage you to look there. The key component of this, is, I think, is really this, this slide which shows that we really focus on forming concussion management teams. And as you can see, there's a list of people on this that are much like uh, our uh, OCAMP group, but really focus on um, including healthcare professionals and educators uh, together on the same team to help uh, students and student athletes to return to school and then to support in an appropriate manner. And also, there's education around what 504 plans are, how to initiate that. Uh, and all that, but uh, as we're finding out, and you know, maybe you'll learn more from folks at Seabird all, is that uh, we have much to do in terms of really uh, clarifying 504 plans in the state of Oregon, even how many there are related concussions, and the kind of process of going through that. Um, and we're we're starting a return to learn program that will help uh, clarify that as well. <clears throat> so, what do we do in clinical care? I'm going to briefly review this just um, so you understand what goes on in kind of the, the doctor's office, so to speak, but talk a little about sideline evaluation, home evaluation, a clinical evaluation, and then kind of what goes on to follow up in, in rehab uh, areas. Most people understand a bit about concussion, but what it is is basically the brain either hitting the front of the skull or actually moving back and forth as, as, it, uh, as you accelerate, decelerate. And you can cause injury to the brain itself or many times you know, not, not a specific identifiable injury, more of a functional problem. But basically, we used to minimize these in the past, but we know that you definitely do not need a loss of consciousness to have a 
concussion. In fact, less than 10% of concussions involve a loss of consciousness. So uh, these are the kind of the mechanisms of injury, which is that acceleration and deceleration we talked about. Could be linear or rotational, either one. Rotational seems to be more significant in causing concussion problems. But this creates a neurometabolic energy crisis, which is basically uh, the chemistry of the brain and the function of the brain cells are not functioning well. This is associated with decreased cerebral blood flow, uh, which either fur uh, even further exacerbates the problem. Uh, and there's a low supply of glucose to the brain, which is glucose is the prime uh, energy substrate for the brain. So uh, there's an ab certainly abnormalities and a lot of like notable um, ions and <clears throat> chemicals, but um, that's still being being understood. But we do know there are endocrine and neurochemical uh, side effects of these injuries. So the brain doesn't function in reproducing its own kind of chemistry, and that creates additional problems. Uh, like issues with depression and, and mood stabilization, etc. And so what we do know is that we see that there are some neurons injury, injured, but there are also axons sheared. The axons are the long, thin kind of wires that connect the neurons, and these can be actually sheared or kink, uh, causing them to be dysfunctional as well. Most of the changes that occur in concussion occur in this prefrontal motor cortex or along the corpus callosum, which connects the brains, in the, um, the brain hemispheres, and then uh, creates kind of a central processing network disturbance, uh, which is really at the crux of uh, most of the problems. <clears throat> you know, this is just a diagram, which I think the only thing I'd like you to see here is that these are hours down here, and there are a lot of changes that occur within within, within hours here, and um, these are actually minutes, sorry. And then within hours here and, and days again over here, you see that some of these changes occur for a long time, like calcium fluxes, Cerebral blood flow abnormalities can occur 10 days or longer. And so there's a lot going on in the brain uh, that we certainly can't identify and doesn't show up on, on most scans. Let me just show you this, uh, this video here. This is, was given to me by one of the local high school parents to show because it illustrates what happens on the field. Now, this number 90 here is one of the biggest guys, and the guy coming to hits him is also one of the biggest guys. Well, if you watch this, you know, look at the force involved here. He gets knocked off his feet. And down, and you know, most people groan when they're healthcare professionals, but that's what people clap for, unfortunately. Um, but there are changes in place now that that becomes an illegal hit. People get ejected for hitting like that, the blind side. And so there are changes being uh, instituted that can help decrease that kind of a kind of a force or involved. There's also real changes that make it uh, that the kickoff team has to kick ten yards closer to uh, the other team, and it makes it so that the, there aren't as many uh, concussions on. Um, on kickoffs and things like that with special teams. So, but anyway, you know, if you've been watching football or contact sports, you know that um, some of these players do get concussions and then, and then they get checked out. And these are the kind of symptoms that they, they have. Um, they're physical symptoms, emotional symptoms, cognitive, and sleep issues. Uh, so, you know, people can play with headaches and dizziness. They can be agitated or depressed and memory processing issues and def definitely difficulties with sleeping. But there can be different type and intensity and duration for each person. Uh, cumulative uh, impairment can occur, and once you get one concussion, you're more likely uh, to get a second concussion by at least three times. So if you look at a recent review by Carney and Gajar in 2014 that they're at OHSU in Stanford, um, <clears throat> they did a large uh, literature review and found that headache and blurred vision are, are of the most common symptoms of people with concussions. Dizziness is, is nearby and nausea and then memory confusion. And those are the main main symptoms that, that people experience in concussion. <clears throat> As part of that paper, they also put together a new definition for an evidence-based uh, systematic review that they went through. And the, the definition, which is also used by the NCA now, says it's a change in brain function following a force of the head. And uh, this may not involve loss of conscious, likely it is not. And then um, it also includes measures of neuro neurologic and cognitive um, dysfunction. Now, what does that mean? Well, those, those issues here are um, observed and documented disorientation or confusion immediately after the event. So that's something that you can observe and actually you can actually keep track of. Uh, impaired balance within one day uh, after the injury, uh, slower reaction time within two days after the injury, and so that's something else that can be measured sometimes on the impact test. 
and then impaired verbal learning and memory within two days after the injury. So these are the result of studies that, that, that these symptoms and, and these signs were found. And again, it's, most of these are within two days. And mostly because that's when the studies were done. They checked people within two days. Sometimes they waited for either two or four days or even a week to check. So when, this is just what the, the literature shows, but it doesn't mean we fully encompass uh, what goes on uh, in concussions yet. But it's the best of the literature so far. What we do know is that there's a lot of issues in concussion that, um, that occur in numerous kind of aspects of the brain and of the neurologic function. So it's important to, to consider this. Uh, and there's even a new move to kind of clarify this into uh, subtypes as well. <clears throat> but we've also been doing some work with Portland State, uh, OHSU, uh, and the Brain Trauma Foundation at Stanford uh, with a new way of looking at concussions, kind of looking at a, a global view of what happens once you get an injury, how that injury affects the, the brain cells, and then how those brain cells and networks uh, actually relate to uh, areas like psychological well-being or cognitive function. <clears throat> so this is in a kind of a pre-publication phase and will hopefully uh, be available to look at in more detail in the future. Well, what sports are involved? These are the, these are the main sports that are involved with concussion. Um, football is, is an obvious one everybody thinks about. Uh, but as you see, the first three sports here are uh, boys helmeted sports, and these are boys high school sports. And so these are sports where you expect to hit head to head with helmets or balls to head. And so, you know, it seems like, well, those, those would be obvious. But then you look here, the next three most common are girls sports, and these are non helmeted sports. And in fact, you're not really supposed to be hitting into each other. Lacrosse is in, in boys is a contact sport, lacrosse in girls. And is not a contact sport. There's no helmets, and they're not supposed to run into each other. So, in that regard, um, you know, why do women and girls uh, get more contact sports than, say, boys in soccer by 1.7 times? Well, it, it is true that actually nobody quite knows, and there's even conferences every year looking at this. So, hopefully, in the future, we'll understand that better. There may be a number of factors, including neck strength, uh, hormonal changes, uh, you know, reporting bias, things like that. Uh, but but you, you never really uh, we can't identify that quite yet. Well, how many concussions occur uh, around the uh, United States? Probably about three million. And if it's about nine percent of all sports injuries, you know uh, that that's a lot, right? Um, but if you look at the participation numbers in Oregon, we probably get somewhere closer to about two thousand head injuries in Oregon high school athletes. People seem to be reporting uh, concussions more likely than they did in the past. So I think this 2,000 is probably more, more accurate. Uh, pros tend to either be resistant to concussions or they don't report them, so they have a lower incidence. So what about soccer? We talk about football. I mean, soccer is the European football, of course. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people participating in soccer. And from the data that I presented at an international soccer and science conference, um, I found that 40% of concussions occur uh, for the arm and elbow to hit the head. So that's that's the cause of it. 60% uh, of concussions occur during contact associated with headers, but not from headers hitting the ball themselves. So that means people are throwing their elbow up and hitting people while they're trying to hit the ball. Um, so that's a key factor to intervene, and I think in the future hopefully we'll be able to figure out how to minimize the contact during headers. That could significantly improve concussion uh, incidents in soccer. Uh, females, one, one thing that came out is that females hit the ground more than, than males, so they're being knocked over more. And this could be another factor why females in soccer do have more concussions as well. So uh, that's another important factor. And the other thing is there is an association between a large no larger number than usual of, of uh, headers and some neuropsych changes that are occurring. So this is an area that needs to be investigated more in high schoolers. Um, that's where these early studies were done because that's kind of a little concerning as well. Uh, because there may be more to the accumulation of, of what we would call sub-concussive blows. So what are you looking for for signs on the field? Well, um, uh, for signs on the field here, we'd say appears dazed or dinged. Uh, confused about the play, I'll just zip through these so you can read them as well. And we don't wait to look for loss of consciousness. We look for signs that they're not performing uh, the way they normally do, or if they can't remember things or if they're having issues in that regard. Well, the one thing we do know from a study, uh, new, numerous studies, but this was done at University of Portland, 
that um, that athletes exhibited a statistically significant more unsafe attitudes than coaches regarding concussion management during games and practices, and many athletes indicated a willingness to play with a concussion. And so this is despite excellent education in these in these um, uh, both these groups. You know, student athletes want to play and they think they can play through concussions. So somehow we need to be able to show them that they're not performing well or their brain's being injured significantly enough that they need to uh, rest if they have this problem. So what are some later signs? Well, these are signs that you might notice, you know, um, if an athlete is in your class or you encounter them in the schoolroom or even as a coach, that they're having these type of problems with processing speed or short-term memory issues, concentration issues, and, and, and mood issues as well. Now, the problem is you have to differentiate this from normal uh, adolescent uh, occurrences or behavior. You know, so this could occur from distraction from all sorts of reasons. You know, um, drugs, alcohol, depression, girlfriend, boyfriend problems, um, staying up too late playing video games. You know, there's a lot of issues that can cause similar problems. So it's, it's particularly difficult, but I think uh, these type of symptoms warrant at least consideration. Was there an injury that could be uh, at least contributing to this problem? <clears throat> And then the question is, when do you send somebody to the emergency department? Well, hopefully, you know, you're not going to be there, with, there when they get hurt. But this is mainly for if you, in the acute period, when they do get hurt, uh, if they're difficult to arouse, if they certainly can't walk, that's a reason to call an ambulance and have them go in. Uh, but ongoing nausea, more than a few episodes of vomiting, uh, significant headaches that are developed just really severe within the first uh, minutes to hours would warrant an evaluation of the emergency department. And anything to do with unequal pupils early on, or just really, really severe um, confusion. <clears throat> the key thing is we're really trying to, in, uh, you know, prevent this thing called second impact syndrome. Fortunately, it hardly really ever happens uh, because it, it, in the extreme case, it causes death. But but uh, cumulative impairment does occur when people get concussions while they're still in the recovery phase from other concussions. So we need to get them all fully recovered, and then through a return to play process, which we'll talk about. Well, what if they go to the emergency department? Well, just so you know, there are other causes of, of, um, of uh, head injuries. In, in an emergency medicine study of non-sports-related concussions, falls, motor vehicle accidents, and victims of intentional injury were the number, you know, were the top three uh, causes of concussion. And cycling and playground were actually still more than sports. So falls could include, you know, playground falls, etc. So it's real important to remember that on the playground or in the school or on the way to school, Kids be, can become injured and get concussions, and you may still be on the front line of evaluating them and potentially sending them for evaluation. So what do we do about imaging? Just to give you a window into imaging, <clears throat> you know, it's really not that necessary to image most concussions unless they are that group of people who end up needing to go to the emergency department because they can't walk, talk, or interact. Or if they have things like seizures or if they have you know, um, significant problems with um, vomiting more than two or three times, that would be another reason to get checked out. And age greater than 60, you know, type of thing. So the younger kids, you generally uh, don't need to get checked out if they're interactive and all that, but uh, it is pretty scary. But if they do go to the doctor, they may not get imaging, and that's okay because most of the time it's not indicated and we don't, uh, don't find anything. <clears throat> so I'm going to just go past the criteria for that, but basically if the criteria are met, for you know, not uh, for, for doing imaging, they pick up 100% of the problems that need to be found in the study. Um, but even when all the criteria are met, only 13% of them are positive. So uh, again, imaging is not that necessary. But there is a lot of research been going on in, in finding that you know uh, symptoms last a lot longer than 15 minutes, which we used to think because we used to send people back with their symptoms resolved in six, 15 minutes, and they often uh, return with exertion. Uh, you know, the NFL and the NHL and baseball has been studying concussions for a long time. And uh, you, some of you may have seen the movie Concussion. I, I think it's great. I recommend it. But um, it's, it does show a higher incidence of depression in those who have greater than three concussions in pro athletes. So uh, that's a significant concern. There's also a risk of premature dementia. If people who have premature dementia, they're more likely to have had multiple head injuries. <clears throat> uh, and there's this thing called tau protein that gets deposited in the brain. Uh, that looks similarities to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, so these chronic traumatic uh, uh, 
degenerative brain injuries. And so there are certain risks that are genetic, and uh, so there may be a, some future reason to be checking some of the genetic background if people are going to consider going to pro sports or whatever uh, if they have propensity to concussions. But probably for the time being, um, th these blood tests are still in the developmental phase, although recently there uh, was announced a, a panel of blood tests that could be useful in diagnosing concussions. Well, this is just what, what brains look like as they get more and more of these injuries, and this is a normal brain that's kind of bluish, and as it gets more brown, this is the uh, neurofibular uh, tangles, these tau tangles and plaques that get uh, deposited in the brain and cause degeneration of the brain here. So that's a scary picture, and we're really trying to prevent that. So. <clears throat> How can we prevent it? Well, we know that helmets in soccer don't work. We wish they did. Uh, mouth guards are really great at preventing tooth injury, but in fact, they probably don't prevent uh, as many concussions, but they certainly decrease the forces through the brain. So wearing them is a great idea because they may prevent these sub-concussive blows. And there are a lot of great technologies in helmets that can detect uh, forces um, in the helmets. It can tell you how many times you've been hit, in which case you can take that player off the field and then identify why they're going to get, say, with because one of the other players always hit him in the head. Now, these, these technologies are expensive. We don't recommend these technologies for most high schools. And they're mainly good for colleges where there's multiple trainers and a video system and all. But anyway, it is an advancement in, uh, in at least in understanding concussions. So the, um, there have been some large international consensus conferences. This is one called the American Academy of Neurology from 2013. Uh, it has great information in it, so I encourage you, if you want to read on this, um, just Google um, American Academy of Neurology Consensus Guidelines or Concussion Guidelines, and uh, these, these are excellent. Also, the guidelines from uh, the uh, Fourth International Concussion Conference, uh, there was one held this fall in Berlin, so that will be coming out pretty soon. This is also an excellent uh, guideline. and. Uh, and you, and you can look up this. This one's called the Zurich Guidelines, and I suppose the next one will be called the Berlin Guidelines, so you can look those up. <clears throat> so, but from this, uh, this conference, consensus conference, they developed this SCAT um, uh, tool, which is the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. And basically, uh, there's a third now, probably soon to be a fourth edition now, but this is a great uh, sideline tool, but also can be used in the, um, in the office setting as well. Kind of looks like this: a large piece of paper. I'm going to break this down. Um, it has a symptom log, which could be taken in the school setting too. If you had, if you were wondering about this, uh, easy enough to do. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these symptoms, but basically they're you know they're, they're headaches, uh, nausea, dizziness, neck pain, and then there's a whole bunch about being slowed down, difficulty concentrating, and then some others down here about being irritable and nervous and things like that. So um, that's kind of the um, assessment tool. We also do a cognitive assessment on the sidelines, which is basically this um, uh, doing um, uh, orientation with dates and times, immediate memory with uh, remembering words, and then uh, digits backwards, which is very difficult, and then using uh, months uh, backwards, and sometimes we do that with days a week if it's somebody who uh, doesn't have their months down. And then we do uh, something called the balance error scoring system, or the best test. And we have people uh, actually balance on their, their feet in different positions, uh, two legs or two feet, one foot, uh, and then in a tandem stance, and, and we count errors. We do some tests finger to nose, back and forth, and then we also uh, check their neck out and things like that, and that's part of the, the scoring system. And so we're doing an assessment to figure out when we can return to play, but we want to really avoid having any side effects, so we're really trying to make sure that you know, we, we find all the problems and, and help them to get better before we return to play. Uh, the basic concept is no same day return to play again, and approximately one week out after concussion, going through the structured return to play program, which we'll talk about in a minute. Quick recommendations are basically stay home from school for about two days until a significant improvement. Use Tylenol for the first three days uh, with theoretical risk of bleeding with ibuprofen. But it's okay to use ibuprofen after that. Uh, there will be some nausea and vomiting commonly, but over two or three episodes is, is uh, a reason to get checked out. Uh, there's no need to wake somebody up all night if they're stable for two to four hours because um, we feel that after that there's been some, a lot of studies to show that there probably will remain 
stable, at least they won't get worse and need any emergent care. Exercise is okay and may be beneficial early on, certainly early with some light walking and then progressing activity may actually help people recover faster. <clears throat> and then avoiding screen time and extreme noise and lights uh, helpful as well. Um, the good thing is, and I'll go over this, um, that 80% of concussions really uh, recover within about three weeks. And this is, a, this is in high school kids, so uh, this was a male football group, highly motivated to get back, but I think the important thing to consider here is that still, you know, after three weeks there's 20% that don't get better, and then it really remains somewhere between 5 and 10% in high school kids that don't get better, and in adults and younger kids uh, there seems to be about 10% that don't get better within three months. And so there's that important group that have that kind of uh, post-concussive type syndrome. Well, what uh, symptoms uh, or characteristics would suggest a delayed recovery? So this is one study that suggests that here that previous concussions, uh, a previous history of migraines in the, in the, in the family or the person would uh, make a, a recovery more difficult. Vestibular or eye problems, um, learning difficulties, genetic problem, uh, predisposition, or age and gender. And it does seem that the younger and the older take longer to get better, and also uh, girls tend to take a little bit longer uh, to get better in, in high school, but still not understood. What symptoms after concussion seem to suggest a longer recovery uh, or complicated recovery? Early dizziness is, the, is the one of the number one uh, problems with imbalance. That's a seven times risk uh, for greater than 21 days. Nausea and vomiting, concentration issues, and photophobia and uh, noise sensitivity are early indicators as well. And then uh, many studies show that early intervention seems to impact recovery. <clears throat> we'll talk about that briefly. Well, how else do, what else do we do before we uh, let people go back to play? Well, when their symptoms are getting better, then what we do is we run them through a neuropsychological testing, particularly if they have a baseline, we try to make sure they're back to the baseline. And this is called impact test. There's other names that have been around and used as well but most of the state use the impact test. This checks memory, attention, and processing speed, and it, it documents cell impairment. Uh, most of this uh, correlates to symptoms, so once symptoms go away, that's the time that you're really supposed to be uh, checking people um, with this test to make sure they're ready to go back to play. Uh, it is about 95% sensitive and specific, which is really as good as most uh, medical tests. As you see here, people who are controlled or, or not concussed can score at 90, 90th, but once they get injured, you know, the, in this study they, they went down to about the 75th percentile or so. And once they said they're feeling better, they still scored poorly. And so this is a great test because it helps us understand that they cognitively they haven't recovered, even though they say, hey, I'm ready to go, I feel better, I want to go back and play. You know, this test does help us figure out um, if they fully recover or not. So that's, that's why it's particularly useful. <clears throat> This can be administered in a computer lab at school. Many of your schools may be doing this. These are just some of the screenshots that have word discrimination, a design memory, which is very difficult, and then kind of a shell game with X's and O's, starting out red X and O's and adding others, <clears throat> and then some distractor uh, functions as well. This is what a report looks like, and you may have seen some of these reports, but these can then um, be used by the um, those medical professionals that are helping manage recovery. <clears throat> it's also great for the educators to look at to see uh, what deficits they have. So th these are verbal and visual memory, and um, and I'll, I'll show you this more closely. So at the baseline, they, this person had 93 out of 100 and a 70 out of 100. So they were at the 75th percentile and the 23rd percentile in verbal and visual memory. After the concussion, they were at 66 and 41, which put them way down to the first percentile. So somebody who could have been scoring A's and B's for sure would be in an area where they might not be able to pass at all. So this test was particularly useful when I first started doing concussion care 15 years ago because I was able to show people that, hey, you know, they have a concussion. And, 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 and because of that, they're having impairments that they can't participate in school and, uh, and perform well. And they, you know, most educators now realize that concussions cause this, so we don't have to do this test early on to show the severe impairments. Uh, so we typically don't do the early test. We typically wait till they're better. But let's say we waited, this person had 14 symptoms early on, but when we wait till they have three symptoms, this person still was significantly impaired here, uh, still at the first percentile. And they can even get worse 
by either going back to school or staying up too late or having too many sensory stimulation, uh, and they can get worse. Um, but finally, you know, with one symptom, you think they would have been better, but they still are at the first percentile in their cognitive scores. I, I may have sent this person back to play or certainly to school, and we wouldn't have noticed that they were having problems in school because we thought, hey, your concussion's resolved. And so this person, uh, early in the early days, may have been sent back to school or sport too early, and they may have suffered from that in a, in a number of ways. This particular person was retested at 20 days, and they were back to baseline, and they were then sent back to play. So you can see how this test can be useful. <clears throat> uh, okay, so... Uh, this is uh, the next area, which is the, the balance. And we talked about this balance test, which kind of looks like this. But what we've been finding is this test is not very accurate. It's great because you could pick up, you know, maybe 50% of people that have balance problems can be detected with this test. But we've noticed that there's a lot of problems with this test. And so at OHSU, we've been trying to find new ways of improving the balance testing. <clears throat> so I'll give you a window into some of this research here, which is kind of interesting. So this is what a normal balance test looks like. Best test, you see this person kind of wobbly, but you'd have to score this, and the score wouldn't look that significant, um, but it's not very, not very high fidelity and not, not digital. But this would be a digital digitalization using one of these almost like iWatch type things on the waist, and you can actually quantitate that better than just giving uh, like a visual score of how they're doing. So you can compare a pre-test to a post-test. And when we do that, uh, we were able to find in this, this large study of, of college football players and different things, that if we put one of these uh, sensors here, we were able to differentiate a concussed patient in red from a non-concussed patient because of the significant difference in the pattern of their, of their um, static balance <clears throat> while standing there. The normal test without the um, sensors gave about a 50% concordance with, uh, you know, it, it was accurate that, to that degree. And then with the, with the balance sensors, we were able to get it to about 80 uh, percent accurate, which is really great. We did a study uh, with 124 athletes showing that <clears throat> those people that get concussed are over here, those in the gray were the controls, but when they get concussed, not everybody has uh, a worse balance, which is above the gray line. But when you do have worsened balance, it takes a lot longer than, you know, two days and, and five days for many of them to get better. Uh, in fact, we return people to play because their other best test scores were normal, uh, and some of those actually even got worse after they returned to play. So that's a significant finding. We do know that there's about a, almost a four times increase in orthopedic injuries in the 90 days after returning to play post-concussion. So there's something going on with balance that's not, not improved and causing, I mean, may be associated uh, with this increased risk of injury. And then when we check chronic uh, concussion patients with symptoms longer than um, uh, even a year, Many of them did have abnormal balance, uh, which was which was uh, interesting and unfortunate. <clears throat> We've been also testing gait, which is also uh, affected by concussion. Normal folks uh, with gait are over here in black and this color, and so uh, when they walk along, they have a you know this is the characteristic of gait's pretty usual about a straight line, and as they move their head, they can continue to walk pretty much normally. Concussed patients have a kind of abnormal gait. Um, and uh, even without uh, moving their head, but when they move their head, they have a significantly worsened uh, gait. So this is another area that we're looking into. Well, once these, uh, once we can identify that also the concussions are uh, uh, resolved in terms of cognitive function, symptoms, and balance, then we can return to play. But we also want to make sure that for the most part their headaches are gone. There are some people that we do allow to return to play uh, with, with headaches, but it's, it's few and far between, and usually people have had it for longer than six months. So that's, that's an atypical occurrence to go back with a headache. And again, we want to make sure they've modified back, gone back to school first. Uh, this is the general return to play guidelines, which is rest until asymptomatic, but really the new guidelines are start exercising <clears throat> at a heart rate less than 70% of max, uh, you know, 60 to 70, uh, which is fairly low load. Uh, until you start feeling better, and then when that happens, then you can, in, in this area, then you can um, go back to sport-specific exercises. But we also want the kids to go back to school by this point, too. So, but they can add exercise, weightlifting, and then <clears throat> non-contact, and then more contact after they've been cleared by the appropriate uh, medical professional, and they can go through a functional skills assessment. 
The other key concept is return to academics, and I know you know a lot about this and there's other talks, but basically engagement in the concussion management team is really important. First of all, identifying one and creating one is the most important, and then creating kind of a guidelines for how to engage the uh, concussed athletes through there. We usually, uh, this should say, or more, really should say approximately two days. We don't think uh, the kids should stay home for longer than two days, um, but sometimes around two days is about right. There's been some studies that show that longer than two days may be detrimental. But, of course, there are those students that need to stay out longer and, and when appropriate. But then getting evaluated by the, the medical professionals and the um, educational professionals uh, and then coming up with a return to academic plan is really important with established uh, accommodations, and I'm not going to go uh, through those. But could include freezing, grade, freezing grades and, and um, some trans, uh, flexibility with transitions. Uh, there's a good paper, if you haven't seen it, on Return to Learn in the medical journal uh, Pediatrics, and it talks about academic adjustments in the first uh, three weeks. If they don't get better, then initiating a 504 plan, uh, and, which is more formal written accommodations. Uh, if symptoms last longer than three or four weeks, in, in engaging concussion specialty teams, uh, and then re recommending in specific educational environments with that 504 plan. And then finally, just making sure that everybody's on the same page with, their, with the concussion team, uh, with the parents and the medical providers, and making sure they're really back to school all the way before they go back to their sport. Doesn't mean they can't exercise, because we want them exercising, you know, which also improves sleep and all that, but just not uh, in a contact way. Well, there's always a story, and I'm not going to go over this one, but you all know this, the stories of these, these, these students who have gone. This is Jamie, and, and uh, she's one of our early folks that spoke out a lot. But, you know, they need special attention, and <clears throat> she did get it and, and recovered and was able to get back to her sport and academics and is writing a book about it. But these are the folks that, if they're not getting better, they fit in these, these tiers of more individualized student interventions. And there really, really will be only a few of them anyway. But unfortunately, they're also challenging. So uh, there's more on the website on OCAMP about that uh, and, and CBER as well. <clears throat> and finally, an individualized education plan and then utilizing the TBI teams, which I'm not going to talk too much more about because uh, hopefully you know already. Um, and then some sort of a return to play form, that, a return to academics form that you use locally is, is good. It, it documents how much uh, accommodation. Um, make use of the Brain 1 1 program if you can. Um, it's still available uh, currently. We've developed that here in Oregon, and it's a, it's a really useful program. It's online. If you haven't seen it, you can access that through the OCAMP website as well. There's a return to play uh, and school form that the OSA has, and if you haven't seen it, you know, it looks like this. You can get an OSA concussion form, Google it, it comes right up, and it helps the medical provider uh, delineate which uh, return to play step the person should be on, makes them understand they're supposed to be back in school before they progress, and then gives some rooms here for some accommodation recommendations. Uh, uh, withdrawal from, not withdrawal from school, but staying home from school or PE, and then when they can return to play uh, with the appropriate signatures. And then some resources that are available uh, from the USA Football, uh, in case you're interested in what's going on in football programs to make them safer, they're at the OSA website. OSA website, we put a lot of great information from CBER on there as well, and so you can also take this course, which is really helpful, and then look at the CDC website, that's, that's often very helpful as well. And just briefly, just uh, kind of what else goes on in the medical uh, area, we use a lot of different specialists, you know, around the patient and their concussion. Um, again, we saw this, but basically, we, I write referrals all the time if people are having persistent problems for a speech language pathologist to look at cognitive and executive function, you know, how they work around. Oops, sorry. And then physical therapists for vestibular therapy, uh, balance problems and neck problems, and then exercise uh, testing and prescription. Visual fun and functional therapy is done by the occupational therapist, and then we have a coping clinic uh, that works on the, the psychological issues. We have a very, very large team that this includes most of them. That include the, a pediatric team as well as, as um, the different specialties are on here, and about 12 different academic and uh, clinical departments are involved as well. Uh, there will be some medications used. Um, again, uh, you should never feel like you need to know these at all very well, but you'll see people coming on medicines like amitriptyline or triptyline for sleep and headaches, different pain medicines, different sleep medicines. We like to treat these headaches like migraines, and that tends to work. 
and we we try to use natural products when we can, but the but a lot of times the headaches aren't well managed, and we just have to focus on improving sleep. Again, these are some of the areas of focus, and uh, I'll be wrapping up here in just a minute. Um, the uh, physical therapist is going to be working on exercise tolerance as well as balance and coordination, so that's kind of their role. The occupational therapist is going to look at visual defects, and we do see that 60% of patients uh, with traumatic brain injury do have some sort of ocular motor deficits like tracking problems, uh, difficulty converging on paper close by, or changing focus from the desk to the uh, front. So sitting closer can be useful. And so there are a lot of visual problems. And uh, this is an area just we're learning much more about, and uh, many people do have problems here uh, that don't resolve, and this can be the biggest biggest problem for them. Uh, we do a number of tests, which I won't go into, but uh, if you were to move your head back and forth and try to look at that visual screen there, um, people with concussions, they actually tend to not have as good a visual acuity with their head moving as they do when it's still. Uh, so that's one area that we assess as well, and that's why they have problems moving around and, and seeing and following things that are that are uh, acting like movies and things like that. And finally, the speech language pathologists look at things, uh, issues like memory, processing speed, and they help keep them organized with planners and 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 help with school interventions. So in summary, you know these are the areas we talked about. Uh, early identification is key. Individualized clinical assessment and then assessment also at the school level uh, is very important. Using these neuropsych testing is useful. Interdisciplinary team is really important. Using all of our medical specialists and, educate, and educators, and then active treatment at home and school with the school accommodation plans, and um, and also again making use of the resources that are online, like these. This concussion course can be really useful. So that's all I have uh, for you. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I do have a number of colleagues that work with me at OHSU and across the state. And so if you're interested in coming to our OCAMP meetings, we, I know we have them around and about, and including, uh, I think we have an, another one coming up in Bend in, the, in April, and probably another one at OHSU in the fall. So um, happy to answer questions. Thanks for listening and inviting me to uh, speak today. Hey, Jim, we have one question. Um, Cynthia would like you to talk about the specifics of Jenna's Law a little bit. Okay, well, Jenna's Law is, is really, we designed it to be really pretty much exactly like Max's Law. The, the, diff, the little bit of difference in that is that um, it does require uh, clubs to come up with a, um, a concussion management plan that gets uh, disseminated amongst their athletes and uh, parents and coaches. So they just have to come up with some system to um, you know, keep track of that. Uh, and uh, it does allow, just like uh, any, just like Max Law, for uh, anyone on the field to uh, identify the, the person, bring it up to the coach. Um, the referees uh, do have a responsibility as well, if they, and they've done this for years, even without the law, to exclude players that look like they're impaired. And uh, the only, the, really, the only way to get back on the field if somebody thinks you have a concussion is if an athletic trainer or a medical professional deems that you don't have a concussion on the sideline. Um, and so those are, that's pretty much the main uh, differences. Are there any questions about that? Or? And I was thinking, Jim, that we would send, when we send everyone the um, recorded version, we'll send the PDFs of Max's and Jenna's Laws off of the OCAMP website to folks so they can read them. We have those one-pagers. That sounds great. And I haven't gotten any other questions in the chat box, so... Last call for questions, everyone. I think, I think we're good. So okay. um, thanks so much, Jim. I really appreciate you doing that. And I'll send you a, a link to the um, video as well so you can use it in the future too.